Welcome back, everybody. So you just heard it. Two counts of first-degree murder, two counts of attempted first-degree murder, burglary with an assault or battery, aggravated stalking, and burglary of a dwelling. Guilty across the board. That man, James Colley, now now will face the penalty phase. Let me bring in law and crime trial analyst Yosha Gunasakara. Yosha, great to see you. It's great to be here. What can we expect today from the penalty phase in terms of uh, a death penalty situation? What will the prosecution do and what will the defense do? This is as violent of a crime as you can imagine. And what's not working in the defendant's favor here is how quickly the jury deliberated. I mean, they just deliberated for two hours, I believe. And when you're talking about such a serious case, the jury doesn't like him. They're, they've made up their mind. Obviously, he's guilty. What we're going to see from the defense is they're going to try to put on what's called mitigating evidence, evidence that humanizes their client or somehow diminishes in whatever way that the crime that he committed. And so one of the ways they're going to do that is they're going to put on information and facts and an expert witness that he actually was on drugs the night of the murder. Okay, so we'll talk about that. There is a live feed in the courtroom. You can see it right there. Uh, we'll update you as soon as something happens. Um, but again, so th let's talk about that. They didn't, during the actual defense of his case, put in involuntary intoxication, saying he was on Cymbalta and Ambien. No, we're not going to do that. But we th I thought that if he's found guilty, we'll put that in as a defense or as a form of mitigating factors now. So how does that work exactly? They say, hey, listen, he was on all these drugs. Don't He doesn't deserve the death penalty? How does that work? Exactly. They're going to argue somehow that he's less culpable, but it's very interesting because the jury already convicted him of intentionally trying to murder his wife and his wife's friend. So that's why it becomes kind of odd. And, and I think the defense is doing this because they have no other options. There's really nothing else to put on. In these cases that are so violent and egregious, the defense is really going to be scrambling to find anything that makes him look better. All right, well, we're going to follow this. As soon as there's an update, we'll make sure to let you know. This is one of the cases that we're following. But before we go into any of our live trials today, and again, we are going to have a new trial in Florida, the Demetrius Elder case, uh, we like to honor police officers here on Law and Crime. So we have a very special segment talking a little bit more about that. Here is the Cop of the Week. Wow, pretty incredible. Back there with Yosha Um you know, it's interesting when we try to, there's so much negative publicity in the, in the media about police, mm -hmm. um, and maybe some of it rightfully so, but when we see these kinds of uh, situations, what does that make you feel uh, as you see this? Because in your profession, you're around investigators and police all the time. It's definitely such a feel-good story, and we need those given the constant negativity that we see in the media today. And we see this cop really going above and beyond the call of duty. I mean, he could have just called 911 and said, this isn't my job, I don't know how I can help you. But instead, he saw someone, an infant that was in danger, and really went above and beyond. It's hard being an officer, especially when young children are involved. We constantly cover these kinds of cases where children are in the realm of violence or certain situations. So it's never easy being in that environment, is it? No, it's never easy. It's extremely emotional, and you have to kind of put those emotions aside in order to better serve the public. And when you are, in, you have to speak with investigators or police about these kinds of incidents in terms of building a case, do you find, what, what is the most difficult part about interviewing them about these kinds of incidents? Well, it's just, it's so, it's so personal. Even though it is their line of work, their line of duty, Really, sometimes we forget that in all of these cases, in all the cases that we cover, at the end of the day, these are human people. These are people who, for us, we're watching on TV, but for them, these are very personal situations, and I think that's important to keep in mind. Absolutely. So we'll always honor the Cop of the Week here on Law and & Crime, and we'll talk more about it a little bit later. But when we come back from our short break, we are going to talk more about the James Colley verdict, what we can expect in the penalty phase, and don't forget, we have that new case, the Demetrius Elder case, that's self-defense one, and we love following those kinds of cases here on Law and Crime. So, we will take a quick break. We'll be back in a minute. Stay tuned. We're covering a lot here today. Okay, so let's break down what the judge is actually saying to the jury. And joining me right now, back with us, Law and Crime trial analyst, Yosha Gunasakara. What is aggravating? What is mitigating? What are these factors? And how will a jury ultimately consider this? So let's break it down. So in order to have him face the death penalty, every one of those jurors 
has to vote for the death penalty. Now, in order to get there, there has to be something called an aggravating factor. We just heard the judge talk about that. That's something that makes the crime even worse. It's, for example, using a weapon, using a gun here. It's multiple deaths. It's premeditation. There's a variety of different aggravating factors that the prosecution is going to present. Then, if the jury does find that there's aggravating factors present, they have to balance it with something called mitigating factors. Now, mitigating factors are essentially things that the defense puts on that says, for example, he was on drugs, he was on Ambien, he's mm -hmm. less culpable, things that humanize him, that make him essentially just mitigating what the prosecution is putting on. So it then becomes a very balancing of what the prosecution is putting on and what the defense is putting there's, on. There's no exact science to it, but in your opinion, how often or how likely is it for a jury to be, to be so unanimous uh, for a death penalty verdict? It's different than guilt or innocence, correct? It really depends on the crime, and here the crime is particularly egregious. So it will really be interesting to see what they decide. Okay, I think we're going to jump back into that courtroom. The opening statements by the prosecution are about to begin, so let's jump live into the James Colley courtroom. That's the defense explaining what evidence they will present as a mitigating factor in this penalty phase. James Colley does face the potential of the death penalty. Let's go back to Yoshiguna Sakara real quick. So you were listening to the defense. He's like, we are not burdened like the prosecution. We have more leeway to say what the mitigating factors are. So from what we hear so far, what do you think of, about these mitigating factors? I think it's going to come down to his family members testifying on his behalf. Jurors like to hear those emotional responses. But what's really interesting is that the prosecution has already established some of the factors. For example, the felony, uh, the commission uh, in the process of a burglary, they've already established that factor. So it's really on the defense to fight for this man's life. Real quick, 10 seconds. Do you, is it possible that they could convince one juror not to sentence him to death? I think it's possible. Death is uh, is a big deal, and, and it's going to weigh heavily on these jurors. All right, we'll have to see. We will take a quick break. When we come back, we're going live into the James Colley courtroom. Stay tuned. Okay, so that was the defense's opening statement. Let's break it down with Yoshiguna Sakara. Uh, throwing a lot out for the jury about what their evidence they're going to present is. Talking about him as a family man. Talking about him at work. Talking about him uh, with prescription medication. And also his, apparently his family history is also questionable. Are these common tactics? Is this something unique? What do you think? This is very common. Again, the defense has everything to lose here. And so they're going to put out anything and everything. Just as a defense lawyer said, the prosecution is limited with the aggravating factors, but the defense attorneys can put out anything, and, and any good defense attorney has to. The idea that he might have trauma from his, ha uh, from his form, you know, with his mother and his father, a uh, violent history, he suffered from depression, cocaine abuse, does that weigh on a jury? Do they think, huh, everybody comes from a difficult upbringing, or this one's a little bit unique? I think there's some unique circumstances and factors here. And what's really going to be important is for the jury to be able to consider everything. They're making one of the most important decisions in the criminal justice system. And, and in their lives. And in their lives. And they should be... Um, exposed to every piece of evidence, every piece of mitigating evidence. And so the defense attorney is doing a good job of pulling out things that may have happened decades ago. The children. He shares children with now his deceased wife. Um, the question becomes, do the children play a big factor in the sense that, hey, we can't kill a father, or they're like, hey, you took their mother away from them. So how does that factor weigh? It's very complicated, and you're hitting the point that there are really two sides to look at things, and we only, it's up to the jurors to decide if it is fair to deprive these children of their father uh, just because he did a horrible and heinous thing. So again, there's no science to this, and it really comes down to the personal feelings of the jurors, which is why it's so hard for the defense, and why they really have to present everything, because maybe one factor isn't going to persuade a juror, but perhaps another different factor would. We're talking so much about the mitigating factors put on by the defense. Let me list you the aggravating factors put on by the state. Mr. Colley was previously convicted of a capital felony or felony invo involving violence. The murders were committed while the defendant was in the commission of burglary, which is a felony. Each murder was heinous, atrocious, and cruel. Each murder was committed in a cold, calculated, and premeditated manner. 
and Amanda's murder only. That was a murder that was committed to someone subject to an injunction and killed the petitioner in that injunction. That is uh, uh, some pretty strong evidence against this man. The first witness uh, called by the state is, being, uh, is coming up there on the witness stand. Let's go live into that James Colley courtroom. Wow, can you imagine being Chris Dobbins right there? I'm here with Yosha Gunasakara. Yosha, I, I think I'm speechless listening to that. He's talking about the new normal. Um, and it's not like she, um, his wife died as a result of a disease or an accident. He can point the finger at somebody and say, you are to blame. How much does that impact the jury? It really impacts the jury. Hearing from a loved one that was so closely connected to the deceased and just hearing the fact that there are three children that are now without their mother. That is very impactful. And these are the things that the jury it has to consider in determining whether this man should, should die at the hands of the state. You notice that many of the witnesses are reading from prepared statements. Is that because it will be so difficult to speak off the top of their head, or is it that they uh, want to make sure they get certain points out? I, I think it's... In this state of emotion, um, it's difficult to remember everything you want to say, and sometimes it's just easier to, to read off of paper and, and at a time when they were able to collect their thoughts versus in this setting where many people are watching them, it's clearly right. televised, there's a lot of pressure on them, it's just easier for them to be able to say everything they want to say through a written letter. Were you surprised that he, he obviously mentioned the defendant? and spoke about him at certain points, but were you surprised that he didn't directly address the defendant or say this, is, this man should be uh, sentenced to death in a, in a more, clear, in a more uh, poignant way? I think he wanted to keep it about his wife. I think he right. wanted to keep it about Lindy and the love and light that she brought to him, to their children, and wanted to use this as a way to honor her uh, because really this is about the victims. This is about the people who died, and, and I think sometimes that is forgotten in a penalty phase. So they're going to a break there. You see James Colley. He is leaving the courtroom. Uh, we will uh, make sure to update you as soon as court is live again. But uh, I want to talk a little bit more with you, Yosha, about this. So we know that the, process, the defense will bring out their own witnesses. May, and again, we can talk about him as a family man, but he ruined their own family. He killed the mother of their children. Exactly. And it's going to be interesting to hear everything taken in totality. There's other things that are going to come out, past abuse. We're going to hear from his family members. We're going to hear what some of the trauma that he's faced. So it's going to be interesting to hear everything as a whole and whether these mitigating factors can truly overcome the aggravating factors in this case. And like you said, there's no science to it. Now, if he is... Uh the jury recommends a death sentence. That's not, a, a, the judge has to actually impose it, and how soon can he be actually executed? So it's going to be many years before he's actually put to death. This case is going to be appealed. It's going to be repeatedly litigated. Many people are not put to death even within just a year or two. It could be a decade before that actually happens. If it happens, again, there's an appeals process. Right. It's extensive. Right. But uh, ultimately, if he is recommended for the death sentence and the judge imposes it, that is the knowledge that that would be happening. So we'll have to see. We have no way of knowing. We're going to cover it more after this. Stay tuned. That was the defense explaining some mitigating factors, how what they're going to present for the jury when they have to determine whether or not their client, uh, James Colley, should be sentenced to death. Now the question is, so they're saying the night before, or the right before the shooting, he had uh, it was on all this prescription medication, cocaine. Um, but let's also consider the fact that he's a family man. He loves his kids. He's close with the family. He uh, was a really good worker, and all these other pieces of evidence. And they're going to try to do everything they can to convince at least one jury member that this man should not be sentenced to death. We'll cover that case in a little bit. But guess what, ladies and gentlemen? 
We have a special giveaway here on Law & Crime that I want to talk to you about right now. So you can go to lawandcrime.com and click the giveaway icon at the top of the homepage. You can win two tickets to Crime Con in 2019 with a hotel stay, meet our very own Dan Abrams and get a studio tour right here of our Law & Crime set, and get a Creepy Crate subscription and a Kindle loaded with true crime books from the lineup. Again, who wouldn't want to win that? So you go to longcrime.com and click the giveaway icon at the top of the home page. I know everybody wants to win that. So we are going to talk more about the James Colley case, and we, I'm keeping a very careful eye on the Demetrius Elder case out of Florida. As soon as that goes live, we'll make sure to go to it. So we are covering a lot here today on the network. We'll be back after this short break. Stay tuned.